Okay. Hello and welcome. May I remind everyone present that the meeting will be recorded via the internet and this recorded archive for future meetings. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do is I want members and panelists to introduce themselves and kind of able to hear the chairman's introduction. Can you all hear my introduction, first of all? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. The yeah. second instruction I'm going to ask is that could all participants mute themselves when not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback when other participants are speaking. Thirdly, if the participant wishes to speak, can they put either their hand up or use the hand up option on the application? You can always put something in the chat as well because I will be monitoring that if you wish to speak. Um, if any participant has difficult hearing or being heard, they should let m either myself or supporting officer, which is Catherine, if they have a webcam, then they could try to turn this off as this will, in order to help broadband or Wi-Fi bandwidth. So if you've got any issues with the connection, the first thing I would suggest is that you turn off your camera, first of all. Next point, if a participant still has any difficulty with their connection, can they please let democratic services know if they if the presenter can dial into the meeting using a telephone, telephone number provided on the invite? If the above should occur, the chairman to say for any technical reason, any party to proceedings unable to continue the hearing will be adjourned for a short time and our contact to be made. It's important to remember that all parties must hear all the proceedings and necessarily themselves decide to leave. What I've asked you all to do before we start the meeting is just to do a brief introduction to who you are because I know we've got some visitors at this meeting. So I start off with myself. I'm Mike Wilson, chair of the committee. Okay, if we can go around in um, order. Um, Councillor Cox. Jeff Cox, Deputy Chairman. Okay, Councillor Charles. Dennis Charles, Councillor for Barry in the Vale of Morgan. Okay, have we got Rob Crowley here? Okay, Councillor Drake. I'm Councillor Pamela Drake. I represent the Castle Anne Ward in Barry. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney. Yeah, Kevin Marney, um, Sully Wood. Thank you. Um, Councillor William. Okay. And can we have some of the officers now? Can we start off with Gemma, first of all? Gemma. Hello, and Gemma Jones, Principal Accountant. Um, James. Uh, James Doherty, Principal Lawyer. Um, Lorna. Lorna Cross, Operational Manager for Property. Okay, and also we have got um, presenters from Tilney Financial. If you could present, if you could say who you are, please, as well. Hi, I'm Richard Stones. I'm a Chartered Financial Planner for Tilney. Thank you. And um, David, do you want David. to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, David Reed, Investor Manager at Tilney and the responsible contact for the portfolio. Okay, and also I understand that Councillor Penrose is also present as well. Do you want to introduce yourself, Councillor Penrose? Okay. Councillor Penrose, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Can we hear him? Okay, we can put him for the record anyway. Okay then, we now go on to the start of the meeting now. Apologies for absence. Got any recorded? Uh, none received, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, now how are you happy for me to sign the minutes of the 20th of January and the 24th of February 2020? Yeah, there's the minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone second that? Thank you very much, Councillor Jeff Cox. Thank you. All right, any declarations of interest? Oh. Okay, no, I can't hear any declarations of interest. Okay, we're now going to the presentation, okay, um, which is led by Tilney Planning and the Investment Report. Okay, if we can start that now, please. 
Hello, um, Hello. It's, it's Richard Stone speaking. Um, it's great to see you all again. Um, even though we're, we're doing this in slightly uh, sort of different circumstances to, to previous years, um, really today what we have prepared for you is very much uh, the same as in previous years. So um, from my point of view, um, I run the account with Tilney. Um, and I guess one of the most valuable things that tends to come from these meetings is that um, we will answer any questions that are obviously relevant. It's been a really strange year. Um, but the investments are, have ha actually held up very, very well, um, considering everything that's been going on. Um, so what I will do um, is pass over to David Reed, who uh, has a responsibility of running the accounts on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then perhaps suggest that we um, break for questions. Um, I guess the only question I'd like to ask initially from a timing point of view, is there a certain period of time that we uh, need to work to today? Say something here. I mean, I think obviously you take as long as you like over this presentation, but are you looking at about half an hour, are you? Yeah, in previous years, it's generally run at about half an hour or so, um, but obviously we can tailor it to whatever time scales you have. So uh, we'll try and get to about half an hour if that's okay. That, you... that should be fine. That should be fine. That should give people the opportunity to ask some questions as well. And I was going to also ask you, do you want people to ask you questions at the end of the presentation while we're enjoying it? I think we're really happy to take questions as, as they come through. I mean, okay. clearly fine. there will be there may be things that sort of pop up this year that are more relevant in these COVID times than normal. So uh, please just ask away as, as we're going. Um, okay. I think if that case, if I just intervene, if I can ask, if I can get members to ask questions in the chat. Okay. So that perhaps you can see that as well. Can you see the chat on there? I can. I can see. I can see a box that says chat next to it, so it's not a familiar Brilliant. system for us, but I'm sure we'll get there. Okay, fine. If there's anything you can't see, just let me know. All right, Dan, and um, we can then I can then refer it to you and ask for you to answer it. Okay, if you can't see it. All right. Brilliant. Okay, Brilliant. just go ahead when you when you when you feel um you know a liberty to do so. Okay. Thank you, David. Are you okay to start the presentation? I think at the moment your screen isn't um, sort of projecting the the presentation as a full screen. Is that better? Can um can everyone see that? Is that clear? Yeah, I can see that clearly. Fantastic. Um, Richard, any other opening comments from you before I jump into the portfolio and what's happening in the world before I get started? Um, I, I, nothing other than I think what everyone's aware of at the moment. I think we are, there are lots of different forces, um, some of which that, that have already happened. Clearly COVID has been the main event um, so far this year, but we've also got Brexit on the horizon um, and also uh, an American election, which isn't that far away. So I think um, probably covering off all of those areas and how that affects the portfolio, especially considering that the portfolio is really designed to produce income to support um, the, the needs. Uh, and therefore, uh, if we focus on that, I think it's probably where we would start normally. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, so then, without further ado, just before I start talking about the portfolio and where we are, just to remind everyone, when we talk about the investment markets, there are two broad markets that are, the, that are the most of interest to us. There's the stock market and the equity market. So that's buying shares in companies, and then you get some of the profits from dividends from the companies and a share of the profits, but also some of the risk. And the other big uh, market that we're most focused on is the bond market. So that's when you are lending money and you're buying debt instruments so in the UK, for example, we have gilts from the UK government and in the uh, North America, they have the Federal uh, Reserve, so treasury bonds. So the equity market and the bond market are the two big uh, asset classes that we look at as investors, historically speaking. 
So there are others, sort of property and things, and we'll get into those in a bit more detail, but those are the two big markets that we're going to look at, and they're the biggest uh, part of the portfolio. So just to make the um, point at the outset, as Richard said, the defining event so far this year has been COVID-19. That uh, hit markets uh, very hard, particularly in March, and we saw the UK fall, the UK stock market fall by over a third, and it struggled to recover uh, since then. And year to date, the UK stock market is down around 20%. Just to reassure you all that the uh, the portfolio that we run for you is only down around 3%. So we are down since January, but it's a relatively small, modest fall compared to some of the other um, uh, situations out there, again, with the UK being down by 20%. And the first um, point to make about COVID is that it's hit different parts of the market very differently. At Tilney, we have a real focus on companies that are neither financially leveraged or leveraged to the broader economic cycle. And that tends to mean that we are underweight some of the more risky areas like uh, the more risky hydrocarbon stocks and some of the less secure financials. So parts of the market that have been hit the worst by COVID, we have had less exposure to. That's particularly relevant uh, for the portfolio because we run the money on a ethical mandate. So we're looking to actively avoid exposure from fossil fuels, um, which with the oil price being where it is, we can't drive anywhere, we can't go on a holiday. So some of those companies have been the worst affected by this. So that's been a positive thing for the portfolio as well. But perversely, some of these parts of the market are the biggest income payers. And the main objective of the portfolio is to kick out that £40,000 yield to fund the distributions from the, for the charity. So not being able to invest in those areas does make getting the income targets more difficult. But again, going forward, we're happy, we think that we, um, that we can uh, do that as where the portfolio is currently positioned. Um, just to make a very quick point that when we look around the world at the moment, the portfolio is globally diversified and that's very important now more than ever because the uh, different country stock markets have very different profiles. So for example, the US market has a very big tech bias, whereas in the UK, we have a much more dominance on banks, insurance, and oil and gas other energy companies. Again, these are some of the areas that we don't want to be investing in given the ethical mandate. Um, so yeah, so the key message there is that we are globally diversified and that's very important at the moment. Um, just keeping the time, currency is important at the moment, um, particularly with Brexit and if you look at this chart here, it shows the strength of sterling since the start of the year. Now, when the line spikes, that's showing sterling weakening. Now, sterling is what we call a risk on currency, which means that if we get a period of volatility, because we don't really export much in this country and most buyers of sterling, they want to either buy a London flat, for example, or buy the UK stock market. So given that our stock market tends to be a more cyclical index. Uh, this means that when there's a period of volatility, sterling tends to fall. And we saw that in March. And that's why that uh, chart spikes up and it shows the strength of the other currencies. But we've also seen a big weakening recently. And that's all to do, uh, due down to Brexit. And the market is pricing in the chance sort of a more abrupt departure without a deal by the end of the year, that has increased from um, before maybe 20% to nearer 40%. And the key point to make here is that the portfolio as it's currently positioned is a globally diversified portfolio. And if there is a fall in the value of sterling because of a bad, uh, sorry, because of an abrupt Brexit uh, deal, the, uh, the, the trust portfolio is uh, ring fence from that and actually will benefit from a fall in sterling. So the way the portfolio is currently positioned, it is a natural hedge 
against some sort of um, abrupt, hard, unplanned Brexit outcome. So that's the first point to make there. The other geopolitical event at the moment that's on people's minds is the election uh, in America. So uh, we have uh, two candidates, Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, and on the investment grounds, we aren't really that concerned who wins. What we do want, though, is that someone to win clearly and it to be a non-contested result. The worst case scenario is some sort of very narrow win where there's a runoff and we this sort of goes on into the new year and it drags on. We want to have clarity and to move on into the next phase of things. The only implication it could have is that if there is a Biden victory, he has indicated that he's quite keen to tax hydrocarbon uh, energy companies in order to fund more spending on renewables in America. He's very much a, um, a, a green renewables energy guy, but given the exposure in the portfolio to oil and gas is basically zero, that isn't a concern for us. So it's not something that we are actively trying to predict or hedge against. The main thing here is that we just want someone to win and someone to win comfortably so we can move on to the next phase. That's the real message there. Um, talking um, in terms of the income from um, uh, the portfolio uh, and the current environment on interest rates and on yield. So the big policy response to COVID has been that we've cut interest rates and we have done additional what we call quantitative easing or for the lack of a better term printing money effectively. Now we did this after 07, 08 when the banks had to be bailed out. I'm not sure if um, any of you are particularly um, well read on this but effectively after the financial crash in 07 most banks globally um, particularly in the west were technically insolvent and we uh, effectively printed money and this money was used to buy the bad debt from the banks. Effectively this money then went and sat on the bank balance sheet and bailed them out. We're doing more quantitative easing, money printing, whatever you want to call that, we're doing that now but the big difference this time around this year is that this money isn't going to sit on bank balance sheets, it's going to finance fiscal spending uh, by governments. So when the UK government wants to spend money, it issues gilts. And then the biggest buyer of those gilts at the moment is the Bank of England with its with this money. So we think the um, possibility of inflation going forward could be higher than it has been over the last 10 years. Inflation has been quite benign, just something that we are looking for in portfolios, just being visited for going forward. And what that means in the portfolio is that we have a real inflation um, uh, bias focusing on investment rate companies that frankly uh, aren't going to have any trouble if we do see default rates picking up going into the winter and the autumn because of covid the kind of bonds that we are investing in are going to be ring fenced from that volatility but also if we do see inflation pick up in the next year or so uh, that that isn't going to erode uh further what's already historically very low yields in the bond market we've seen interest rates come down hugely over the last 20 years and then back in the 1990s if you were a, a, a investor going into a, a pensioner going into retirement your bond portfolio would get you 10 percent comfortably in the current scenario the bond market generally sits on negative real yield so it's a really challenging environment to get uh, an attractive income yield uh, in a safe way. Um, but what is interesting is that in the last few weeks, we have seen a slight pickup in sovereign yields. And this is the cost of capital that um, the White House, um, that the UK government and so on have to pay when issuing new debt. And I'm beginning to wonder are people becoming more aware of the possible risks of inflation and could we see yields rise in the future? I think that's a fairly um, open debate at the moment but again it's just making the, the point that if we did see a pickup in inflation 
lots of these bonds in the market. To give you an example, the UK uh, government gilt for 10 year is giving you a 0.2% yield. That's an annual return of 0.2%. So if you have any sort of inflation going forward, that will erode that return very quickly. So we have to be very, very selective on the kind of bonds we're buying in the portfolio, fucking focusing on, again, there where there's a quality coupon, investment grade, um, and we are we have very minimal exposure to nominal yielding sovereign debt. We prefer the inflation linked uh, element to that. So that's the world in sort of five or, or 10 minutes. Just to recap in terms of the portfolio and how we're positioned in the portfolio. So I mentioned at the beginning that the two big asset classes are uh, equity and the bond market. So the equity is the engine of the portfolio and that is just over 40% of the portfolio and that can go as high as 50, but 40, 42% is around the typical weighting. So within that, we are uh, globally spread. We have a five to the UK because we're trying to produce UK uh, income and the UK market is the best place to be for income. We have exposure to North America, Europe and being spread as well. And that's part of that Brexit risk. If we do have a fall in sterling, all of these investments will rise in the in value in sterling terms. So the portfolio is a natural hedge against an abrupt Brexit. Um, and then elsewhere in the portfolio, we have the exposure to fixed income, again, with a real bias to investment grade, quality, safe issuance. So if we do have any sort of volatility, I think we are going to see further volatility in the autumn and the winter. I think we will see unemployment increase. And I think we will see, unfortunately, some businesses go bust going into the winter. And that's what we just want to be really alert and aware of the possible default risks, making sure that the firms that we hold are of the highest possible quality. Um, so um, I'm very happy to go through the portfolio line line by line, but that might be a bit too too much detail for this scenario. But I think just to um, make a, a point in closing about how we're positioned, we are the equity in the companies that we hold are the firms with the strongest balance sheets that are the most resilient in any sort of volatile periods, and that will come through this period stronger because it means they can acquire the other uh, companies that are weaker when they have when they go through distress and sometimes they go bust we can effectively acquire those companies it means that they can consolidate their position on the other side our base case is that uh, there will be a vaccine at the end of this year start of next year but we are very conservative and we're always thinking about well, what could be the worst case scenario here but our base case is that we do get a return to normality at some stage over the next few months and that we begin sort of a journey back to normality and that will lead to a sort of fairly broad uh, swing in markets over the um, medium term. And that links into my final point um, about the uh, income of the portfolio. So this year um, we saw uh, financial companies um, and some uh, banks in particular and insurers, they effectively were stopped from paying dividends. So there was a, this wasn't reported widely in the UK, but to HSBC, for example, it's very much a global bank. Most of its money comes from China, Hong Kong, and that part of the world, but it's listed in the UK. They were told by the UK government that they couldn't pay out a dividend to its global share base. And this was a massive problem in parts of Asia, in China. They saw it as a very aggressive geopolitical move um, because lots of Chinese investors, for example, hold HSBC shares for the income. <laughs> and effectively, we said, we want you to not have the income and hold it in your balance sheet because we don't want to have to pay if, if the worst case scenario happens and we have to step in again. We don't want to have to pay for that, um, that cost. So it was a really bad year for income and lots of companies use this year as a chance to rebase their dividend so you have seen lower uh, income over the last 12 months than we thought we would see this time last year we have made some changes in the portfolio recently and we are comfortable and we're confident that going forward we will reach that 40,000 uh, target 
but just to make the point that the last 12 months have been a bit of a tricky time uh, for us as income investors. So that is a very brief sort of 15 minute, 20 minute summary of the world and the portfolio. Um, are there any questions from um, anyone here about the markets, about the ethical uh, views in the portfolio? Um, any comments at all or anything else that I can help with? Yeah, can I ask any members if you've got any questions? Because I got a couple. None. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Okay, you mentioned about the Bank of England. Um, obviously, you know, bailing out a lot of the financial industry at the moment, including like they did in 2007, 2008. But what I think what's interesting is that the Bank of England holds quite a lot of gold reserves. And what you haven't mentioned is about the rise in prices of commodities in particular. And I just wondered perhaps why aren't we investing in things like commodities, for example, or are we? Question mark. Yeah, yeah, good question. Do you want to go through them all? Or shall I answer each one in, in turn? I think, I think that's the first question. The second question is obviously, you know, you mentioned about the American election, obviously what uncertainty, um, but one of the things obviously that that is an issue is if the safe for instance, there is instability in America, I should imagine the value of the dollar will go down. And what effect will have will have on that our portfolio in particular if that does happen? That's my other question. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and there are two good questions. <laughs> so thank you very much. So on the subject of um, commodities, so just so everyone on the on the um, conference knows, when we talk about commodities, uh, they have been historically used as a hedge against inflation, and the big common ones are. Um, oil, uh, gold, and you can also get things like coffee beans and cocoa in a broader basket, but oil and gold are the, more, are the most popular ones. Now, um, gold to me is a natural uh, hedge uh, against currency debasement and inflation. And for most of our clients, we increased gold in the portfolios back in March this year when we saw the response to uh, to what we were doing with COVID with lots more money printing. And the price of gold is up by about 20% since the start of the year. Conversely, some of the uh, uh, oil and gas uh, parts of the commodity basket are down very sharply. So when you look at the commodity basket in the round, it's a bit of a mixed picture. Now, one of the points I wanted to pick up um, with you um, today is that because we run the portfolio on an ethical basis, that has historically stopped us from holding mining companies and from things like holding gold in the portfolio. Now, I think going forward with uh, currency debasement being much more of a prevailing theme, I think, over the next few years, if uh, one thing that we maybe should consider is do we want to hold gold in the portfolio despite the ethical framework in which we're, we're operating? and that's probably a question for you guys to discuss and then let me know about it. But um, I think there is, as you say, Mark, a strong case to hold gold in the portfolio going forward if the ethical criteria allow us to, to do that. The second thing, on the, uh, on the American elections, the base case that we have here is that the way the system is designed over there and the electoral college system is that we think there will be a winner. Um, the polling at the moment suggests that will be uh, Mr. Biden, I personally wouldn't want to put bets on that personally, but uh, our base case is that, is that we will have a, have a winner. Um, and the message from me to yourselves is whoever wins, your portfolio isn't going to be affected either way because of the, again, we, we haven't got that, that hydrocarbon bias. As you say, Mark, if we do have a, uh, a hung US result and that drags on, that could weigh on the dollar but also that will have ramifications probably for the wider world. And actually, when you have global events that are volatile, the dollar as the world reserve currency tends to do quite well. So it would depend on exactly how the US and how, how bad it was and how dramatic it got. But um, actually it might uh, counterintuitively, if there is a uncertain result there, it actually might lead to some dollar strength that people want to 
hunker down and be more defensive in their portfolios. You'll probably see the yen rally quite strongly as well. Uh, and we hold Japan in the portfolio as well. Is that helpful, Mark? Is that um, useful at all? Have I covered off those questions? Uh, that was really helpful. Um, I got Thank Councillor you. Cox on the line who wants to ask a question as well now. Great. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I notice we have a, a number of ethical investments. And, and in fact, uh, you bought shares re recently in uh, Trojan Ethical. Is, is this because you see them as a good investment or because they're ethical? So the answer really is is both. Now, um, any portfolio at Tilney has a what we call a light green ethical bias anyway, because generally we don't buy overweights in firms that are either financially leveraged or exposed to the wider economic cycle, which tends to mean they're underweight oil and gas miners and some of those parts of the market. Um, although we do hold them for some clients, depending on what the rationale of the portfolio is. Now, my understanding um, with the Welsh Church Act um, portfolio is that we are looking to invest in a sustainable, responsible way. So we're looking to screen out some of those areas. But that being said, uh, Jeff, we wouldn't look to invest in any fund or any part of the market that we didn't think could be justified on investment ground. So I'm giving you a bit of a long answer here, but I suppose the answer is, we're doing it on ethical grounds and on investment grounds. I mean, we would never let the ethical um, tail wag the investment dog, if that's any reassurance. Oh, right. Because a lot of people think if they're ethical investments, uh, we get a lower return, but it's not always the case, is it? No, not at all. I mean, we've, I mean, um, you know, in the portfolio, we have things like um, Green Coat, for example, that have done you know very well year to date. Um, I mean, if we have um, time, I'll just go through some of my favourite examples, if we could. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, where are we here? So hopefully you can see here now. But um, in this part of the um, portfolio here, there's a company called uh, Civitas and Greencoat UK Wind. Now, Greencoat UK Wind is a company that Tilney helped launch about 13 years ago now with the UK government, the Green Investment Bank. So. They've got a dozen sites all over the UK uh, providing uh, wind energy now for over a million homes. And they've just come to us now looking to raise more money because they want to basically buy the site and get some more wind turbines going. And they are targeting total return of in the region of seven, eight percent, which has RPI linked inflation and protection because the contracts they have with the government is they guarantee the price of the energy. So it comes back to that inflation argument we were talking about a moment ago. So uh, that um, investment's done very well. Year to date, it's up when the market is down, and it's helping um, it's helping the UK move towards a more renewable space. I mean, we haven't got to import oil and gas from Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, and I think this will become an increasingly important. Uh, part of our energy makeup going forward. So it's a great way to not just make a good return, but to help the UK move towards that sort of place where it wants to get to. Um, the other one is a, um, is a company called Civitas. And what they do is they basically uh, acquire, develop and run social housing for vulnerable adults to let them stay in their homes um, longer so they haven't got to go to I'm not sure what, what what the right term would be, but um, institutions or, or or wards where they're sort of looked after by staff. You try to keep them in home for as long as they can. And uh, again, this is all money that is effectively backed by uh, local authorities, so effectively taxpayer backed, really. Um, but they had a really good result from this. They basically run themselves like a charity. If you go on their website, um, it's a it's effectively run themselves as a charity. But it's a charity with governments contracts again inflation linked which we as capital providers as investors can benefit from so uh, it's about trying to find investments that we like on investment grounds that are also doing something positive as well and trying to make that positive change and there's just two examples in the portfolio that um that, that we have there thank you has so anyone else got any questions okay in that case can i thank you both of you for your presentation that was 
really, really interesting. And um, I'm glad that you're sort of managing it pretty well, given the challenging circumstances that we all face at the moment. I mean, obviously, I think the important bit is that we constantly review what you're doing. And I think you're obviously reviewing what you're doing all the time, which is really, really helpful to us. Um, have you got any questions of the committee at all, yourselves? Just the, um, the, the, the sorry, David, you go first. Just one. the one thing that would be interesting would be on the, the point about gold. I don't know if, um, because we have this ethical mandate, for lots of clients, that means no commodities, uh, nothing that comes out of the ground effectively. I'm not sure, would the, um, would the, would you be opposed about holding gold in the portfolio going forward? Um, and maybe I think I think, some... I think what we need to do is obviously discuss this probably after you after you've gone. If you don't disrespect to yourselves about sure. where we go on these sort of issues, um, and obviously we take some advice from officers as well on the council about where we're going. As you know, I'm a fairly new chair to this committee, and I know there's some people been here a bit longer than me, and obviously I will take their views on board as well. I mean, I personally like the view that we are largely an ethical investor, but of course, we also need to think about maintaining the £40,000 income coming through. So I do think we need to review our portfolio, as we all should, to be quite honest, given the market. But also, there's something called, one of my passions, is, is fair trade. And I know that, you know, something that we do need to look at is certain investments, perhaps in certain industries, which commit ourselves to more fair trade but that's my personal view um but again you know i'm reminding everyone here that we are trustees and one of the jobs of trustees is to maximize income from our investments but you're absolutely right we also think we should do it ethically that's my my personal view and i think that's the view of the committee but obviously i think perhaps when you sort of um leave us we can have a brief discussion on this and i've got one or two other matters to discuss but i would like you not to be here no disrespect to yourselves all right absolutely um a, a couple of other things maybe to um to consider as well for, from me um we have maintained the same risk profile for you um since our relationship started um, and every year we would always want to make sure that you're comfortable with that. Um, you are, uh, we, we run seven different gradients of risk. Um, you are a level three on that scale at the moment. And that puts certain constraints upon us in terms of how much we can hold uh, in things such as stocks and shares. So um, a bit of a discussion around that, whether there is any change necessary and whether if you were going to change, whether now is the right time to do it, okay? Um, the, the other point that I think is probably worthy of discussion around all of these issues is, that as far as I know, the trust can only pay natural income, if I'm correct. It cannot pay capital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, in terms of the assets that we hold for you, um, it's always a bit of a, a discussion point as to whether those assets are going to produce capital growth, which you're not going to be able to access, or whether they are going to produce income. Um, so gold is a good. Um, can I can I clarify what you're saying there, um, just for the benefit of the committee? What you mean by that? It's say, for instance, you've got a new a company. Say, for instance that is sold out to another company, does that mean we cannot reach a capital gain from that? We're not allowed to, or is that capital gain got to be reinvested in the portfolio? Yeah, so the, the, the capital gains are at the moment are being stored up in, in the portfolio, um, and it's only assets that are paying a natural income. And gold's a good case in point, and David will know more than me on this, but um, our gold holdings, do they pay any any income whatsoever? They may go up and down in value, but do they pay an income? It depends on what we're holding, I guess, David. Yeah, so typically we hold uh, physical backed. So we literally are buying gold in a, in, in a vault uh, and there isn't an ongoing uh, yield from that. So that's the sacrifice that you take. That's a, a hedge against inflation and a hedge against market falls to protect the portfolio value overall. So that's the opportunity cost of holding gold is the lack of yield. 
Okay. I mean, I think, again, this is a sort of discussion I need, we need to have without you guys around, because I do think that's a that's a good technical matter to consider. And whether we are in our rights to do any change, I really don't know. Um, open to any other member before I finish this up, this bit? Yes, Councillor Janice Charles. Janice, do you want to unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering if um, the the they could advise us whether the time is right to change now or not, because that's the sort of information we need from them. Okay, do you want um, to answer that? Um, so I think from my perspective, you'll you'll never get that time right um, because it's it's uncertain. I think what we can say is that. There are certainly three events which are going to be quite key over the next um, six months. Uh, so the vaccine, uh, the presidential election, and Brexit will all will, will all be moved on in that six month period. Yeah, you know, if you were to increase your risk at this time, um, then and those things were to go well, then clearly there would be a profit um, from that. But if they were to go badly, you could dent the fund and i think that would be it, in my view it would be something you probably would not want to do until some of these matters are, are more settled okay thank you. All right. yeah. I thank you all right can i thank you for your presentation okay and um we're now going to move on okay if um okay if you want to okay we're now um we can ask Richard, David. David. Yeah, Richard and David, um, are you are you okay to leave the meeting, or do you need me to dismiss you? That's fine. I'll um, no, I'll, I'll leave. Uh, I'm not being rude. Too. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no um, problem. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very you. much, Thanks both. Cheers. Right. Thank you. Um, can I just double check, um, Councillor William? Can you hear us? Can we hear you? I had been advised he'd come in on the phone. All right, we'll try and contact Councillor William. Okay. All right, then. I thought we have a little discussion. Um, bear in mind, they're both gone. Um, just about a few points that they made there. And I got some... Uh, 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 there's one or two things that obviously we, we should also look at is the cost of them as well. Um, and I know... Gemma, do you have any views about that at all? I mean, should we review um, these people um, given the situation that we're facing? Or perhaps do we perhaps review them after a few months' time? I don't know what your view is, Gemma, on this. I mean, it is very difficult to judge. It's, I mean, it's a very tricky year in terms of managing investment. I mean, as a council, we don't have um portfolios of this nature and, and i'm not a financial planner um m my feeling is uh, we didn't choose tilney they they bought out a company that we were already using um uh, the problem is if you look at um a new investment advisor they will sell the investment as we have at the moment and they will purchase new investments at such time you crystallize any loss that you've made on the investment and with investments we're looking at a long-term horizon um, my feeling is that perhaps the yield is a, a bit disappointing and anecdotally i think that the investment management fees are quite high um, but as i say we haven't got similar investments to benchmark against I, I think perhaps we need to look at what other welsh church act investments are getting um, on their investments and do a piece of work around um, whether the yield is reasonable, whether the investment management fees are reasonable. We've been with um, precursors of Tilney for a number of years and we haven't done a kind of um, benchmarking procurement exercise, o although the timing is, is quite difficult to do this. Um, but I think, I think it, um, just a benchmarking exercise would be useful at this point. I, I personally think it's no harm in doing that. Kevin, do you want to come in on this? Um, yes. Um, well, basically, you'd have to um, put forward 
a comparison of what similar sort of firms charge for their services and also come up with um, uh, whether what you refer to in benchmark um, a whole list of uh, a bit of research and a whole list of what other funds have been doing I mean if, the, if they're saying 3.8 percent isn't bad uh, down on investments uh, given the circumstances well on face value I could do that without having studied the financial markets but if we have a look and find out actually it's middling to poor well then that would be a reason for looking around if it's considered to be good then apart from the cost of the actual management um, why would why would you move um, the other thing is in general I've got to be perfectly honest with you we've dictated uh, as much ethical stuff as, as we can you know to a certain degree you can go on about fair trade you know, as you said you have your own personal opinion fine there's a, there's a lot of issues about fair trade as I'm sure you probably know as well and, and dispute about that um, but I think we'd all probably like any of our investments it's something that's fair and, and, and whatever but at the end of the day whoever we employ they're the experts as far as I know none of us sure are running a hedge fund I mean, basically, if it just had a half hour explanation, which they have to do, on, on what a hedge fund manager, uh, not a hedge fund, I should say, an investment manager does. Well, you know, we could, could cut that up down to five minutes, I think. We all know what they do. None of us really understand it, or we'd be doing it ourselves if we could make any money. So basically, the two points there, are they comparable with other firms for the cost that they're charging us? Has their performance over the last year been good? And we'd need to look at other parameters or indicators to see that. Um, if they're fine, leave them to it. I, I think the only thing we should really be looking at is that, that risk thing. I almost got an impression that they want us to improve our risk. Um, well, that would give us more money, but I think at these times that would probably be a bit uh, a bit dodgy. Investing in gold, as they said, that's okay to protect the actual capital. Um, possibly, we know that gold is very high at the moment, so it could go down again. None of us are gold traders, I wouldn't have thought, and we don't get any money back off that, do we? So. These are the things that strike me. I've, I've, thank you very much. That's a good summation, Kevin, of what they said. And I thought, you know, we. Do, I think there's no harm in benchmarking, um, as Gemma rightly says. And I think there's no harm in doing so. Um, James, do you want to come in on this? I think one, one thing I was going to um, mention, I, I wonder if it's a case that this is a company sort of that we have been with for a very long time, whether a benchmarking exercise might be a good point for kind of if there was any kind of um, charity commission audit of the way we run our money if we're spending almost half our yield on the actual service being provided whether um, whether there's some value in in just for an audit trail being able to say that we've looked into it I, th I think that's a helpful remark Kevin do you want to come back on that uh, yeah it's just an only one thing um <laughs> As many of you may know, that uh, I never really say anything that I ever bother being uh, care about being repeated. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't come out with it. But um, isn't this meeting being um, transmitted uh, on the public uh, web or logged for that? So aren't we actually discussing uh, business matters in, in a in a public forum? Or if I misunderstood what's going on? As far as I'm concerned, I mean, the job of us trustees is to maximise the income. And I think the discussions we're having are mostly about that, and that's the aim of the trustees. Um, I don't think we're going into the firm itself. I just think there's no harm in doing a bit of benchmarking, and I think that's what I'm trying to move members towards. But I mean, it's obviously in, I'm in your hands as to what your feeling is about that. I mean, if I make suggestions, perhaps maybe we do some benchmarking and to look into other organisations, and I think. James's point about an audit trail is a good one because I do think we should be looking at that in terms of charity commissioners actually they probably would expect us to do a bit of looking around our advisors and also I think Gemma's point there's no harm to look at you know um, other firms when it doesn't mean any commitment you would expect us to do that occasionally um, to do that and I think you know we've got a very mind we have got a volatile market we've got a lot of uncertainty and although we got some good points they made about they think we will raise that that forty thousand pounds that we need, but it's also been pointed out that that's almost half the charges that we pay as well. So I do think we need to look at that. But I just wonder does anyone would second my recommendation? Yeah, Councillor Drake, Councillor Cox. Okay, we're all happy with that. 
Yeah, I'll 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 second second as well. But uh, thank you very much. I think I think mo most of these wealth advisors, if you if you look at them, you'll find they've all lost money on the port value, portfolio value, and the income levels have also dropped. It's a question of how much is one deteriorated versus another investment advisor. But I think they they're going to be consistent in the way the market has gone. All right, thank you for that. All right, we're now going on to the next. Um, can, I say can I say something, Mark? You know, sure. it's been pushed down our throats for a long, long time to shop around, isn't it? You know, with the insurance, all different things. Yeah, and yeah. I think we we should be taking that on board because we we are spending an awful lot of money on this company. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All happy to move on now. Yeah. Um, Gemma, do you want yeah. to say something? Please? Um, Chair, can I just flag the issue around the um. The gold. I don't know whether um, we were yeah. going to have a discussion about that. Whether you want me to to find out as part of the benchmarking exercise, what other Welsh I think out. I think we also need to find out about the remit. If we got a remit where we largely ever call, I'd like to see the minutes of that and to see, see where the stance comes from on that at all. That's what I was thinking before we can whether we can move our portfolio or change it because I really don't know. Yeah, I think I, th I think that came from a previous Welsh Church Act committee, um, and um, I can confirm the the committee that the conversation um, took place in. That I can circulate the um, the date of the committee if that's helpful. Perhaps maybe we could agenda that on for the next meeting as well, as well as the benchmarking exercise. If you think we have sufficient time to do that in the next few months, Gemma, is that all right? Fine. OK, then, thank you for that. Can we move on to applications for financial assistance? I think it's yours, Gemma. I can't hear you, Gemma. OK, hello, good evening. I can hear you now, that's good. Applications yes. for financial assistance 2021. Um, so, um, if I could jump about around a bit in this report, but if we could look at um, Appendix C first. Um, okay. I've um, based my um, income projections on, um, in terms of property rent, we've received the vast majority of, of those property rents so far this year. So there's no reason to think those are gonna be significantly hit by COVID-19 this year. But I have um, assumed slightly less in year just in case. Um, in terms of the projected investment income, I've based this on a slightly reduced um, amount of the um, projected income um, from the Tilney report. Um, historically, we've received slightly less than um, has been shown in that report. So I've um, based that on kind of historically what the, the difference is. Um, in the report, you'll see a recommendation that there's a couple of grants um, that are outstanding still from 1718 that amounts to 10,000 pounds. I propose as part of this report that we um, look at informing those organisations that they'll need to reapply for their funding, given that such a long period of time has elapsed since they were awarded. Um, and then assuming that that is agreed to, we'd have 46,500 pounds um, to allocate for grants in um, this financial year. Um, the grants are set out in Appendix A to the report, um, which I will run through now. Um, so the first award is one that's recommended by Cardiff and um, the Holy Family Catholic Church. Um, so this is a venue in Fairwater. Um, it's a very important community space, um, but the criticism of the area is that it's quite cold. So this will be the supply and fitting of a new heating system. Um, in terms of um, the funds, um, given that we have limited funds available, um, we took into account the amount of reserves that the organisation had, and therefore we were proposing that um, a grant would be recommended of £2,500. Um, moving on to the next one, Tabernacle Baptist Church, um, again recommended by Cardiff Council, um, and this is around disabled access to the facilities. Um, it's quite a large scheme with a number of other um, income sources and grant applications. So proposing an award of 5,000 pounds here, 
um, but awarding in principle pending the outcome of those grant applications. St James's Church WIC um, and a project to establish a health and safety environment. So they have some damp and safety houses at the church. Um, and again, um, quite a large scheme with a number of different grant sources um, and a proposal again of £5,000, but to be made in principle pending confirmation that the scheme could proceed because there was a shortfall in terms of the church's contribution there. Um, Barry Romilly Bowling Club, um, and this is a scheme to attract new younger members to the facility um, and to cover membership costs. Take into account the limited of funds and um, and also the kind of amounts that were held by the club. Um, there's a recommendation for no funding um, for that application. Um, we have um, an application from multiple sclerosis um, project, and this is across Cardiff and the Vale, um, to um, provide support um, post um, COVID-19. Um, taking into account, again, um, this, this is quite a large organisation, and um, the funds available, proposal toward £2,500. Salem Baptist Church Barry, um, looking to provide bypassing automatic doors and purchase new stackable chairs. Again, taking into account the um, funds of the organisation, proposing to award £2,500. Um, vale Glamorgan Brass Band, um, looking to convert the toilet facilities um, so they would be suitable for disabled access. Um, there were two options that were put forward take into account the, um, the cheaper option um, looking towards 75% of that um, projected cost, um, so £2,304. And then finally, T having Children's Hospice. Um, this is a, a large 20th anniversary refurbishment um, for um, an area known as a transition suite. Um, this is a scheme that was um, referred to us from the Strong Communities Fund as it didn't meet the award criteria. Again, there are a number of um, different applications in as part of this scheme. Um, so looking to propose £5,000 there, but made in principle pending confirmation that the scheme can proceed. Okay, thank you for that. Are we all happy to proceed on that? Yep, I haven't heard anyone in dissent in. Okay, all happy? Thanks, good, excellent. Okay, you want to move? Move on to the next agenda item. Okay. Um, one of the things before I think we finish on that, on number five, is obviously one of the things we don't do so much is publicity. When we award these rewards, I think we should publicise the good work that we do as a committee. And I think that's something we could do, maybe a couple of press releases with these um, bodies. And, you know, it's quite common practice amongst other organisations when you give out money that there is some sort of, you know, thank you or check or whatever we can do. And I think that's something perhaps we should move on, perhaps. OK. And the other thing I thought, yes, Pam, do you want to come in on that? I was just going to say that also highlights it to the general public, these particular organisations, because a lot of them don't know about them. Exactly. It may actually help them organisations get more funding that way as well. So I think perhaps we should do that. OK, I also think it might be a good idea, perhaps maybe post COVID, perhaps, is that we revisit some of the places that we have awarded in the past to see what improvements the Welsh Church that's have done, you know, especially to these places of worship and other places that that we do some good work there, you know, of, of previous chairs on the committee. And I think that'd be worth doing that as well. So, you know, perhaps maybe we can do that optimistically. I think fingers crossed in the summer. You know, and I'm being optimistic. All right, and thank you for that. All right. Yeah, um, can Councillor Marnie, please come in. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Councillor Marnie. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. No problem. Um, I don't know if it's an unfortunate choice of words there. It's not the good work that we do. All we're doing is doling out money. It's the good work that the fund does, not the individual. Absolutely right. Fund. Absolutely yeah. right. So, You're absolutely right, Kevin. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. All right, then. So if we now move on to um, the annual report and accounts, please. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, sure. So, 1920 so um, was a relatively straightforward year until um, we got to um, March um, last year. 
So um, there has been a movement on the fund balance. You can see there's a reduction of 127,000. Um, this is largely due to um, a fall in the best investment balances as at 31st of March, as you as you would expect, we had a reduction of 121,000 um, compared with the previous financial year. There was also um, a deficit on the um, unrestricted funds. Um, so if I just take you through the um, report. Um, so um, there, there was a deficit in the year on the fund. Um, so you'll see that um, our investment income um, was reduced by 7,000 when compared with 1819 and reduced by 12,000 when compared with 1718. Um, we had reduced the grants allocation in, in 1920 to take account of that in part, but it wasn't um, sufficient. Um, there was a very slight increase in expenditure of 1,000 um, pounds relating to repairs and maintenance. So, so as I mentioned, the, the significant loss was on investments, 121,000, and that um, as was picked up in the investment advisors presentation happened very quickly in March 2020. Um, so we do have um, an unrestricted fund on the um, in the account um, of 112,000 as at 31st of March last year. Um, and we have to kind of assess whether we feel that that is appropriate. Taking into account the value of our um, investment assets, investment properties and um, which are set out on the balance sheet which is on page sorry page 10 of the accounts um so investment properties were at 3.2 and um, just over 3.2 million we feel that that's, that's reasonable uh, have we lost you Gemma Think we've lost her. Gonna try it and get on. We're gonna try calling you Gemma if you can hear us. Any luck? Okay. Councillor, did you want me to um, just do a quick update on that £30,000 point um, whilst we're waiting for Gemma to come back? Yeah, I think I think when Catherine's on to... Yes, I think, yes, James. If we can do that now, please, Gemma. Please, okay, James. yeah. Yeah, so I'm just dragging it up. Um, so there was in the accounts... There sorry, is James, a James, sorry, oh, yeah. before you, you proceed... Just going back yeah. to Councillor Marnie's point um, made about the fact that this is a um, a, uh, a a meeting that can be viewed um, in terms of any um, legal advice. Just making that point. Fine. In terms of the thirty thousand. Yeah, I mean, I was just. I think the the update is probably going to be that I'll need to provide a more detailed update at the January meeting. Um, in so far as there was some money allocated to a potential um, sort of highway scheme on some land we own, um, but a number of legal issues have arisen, and that's why that money is still allocated. So that scheme hasn't been taken forward. Um, there are some issues that I'm going to be looking into. Um, hopefully, we'll have a report. We'll be able to bring a, a report or a further update to the January meeting. 
Fine. Hello. Okay. Hello. Are we through now? Yeah. Hello. Gemma, sorry you... about that. That's all right. Um. So um. So I think we can we feel comfortable that the reserve balance is um appropriate taking into account the balance of the um, investment properties. Um. Other than that, I think it's, as I said, a relatively straightforward here on the accounts. In terms of the process now, um, Wales Audit Office will now conduct um, an external examination um, over the next couple of months, and we're required then to file the accounts with the Charities Commission by the end of January um, 2021. So that will be taking place over the current coming months. And obviously, if, if um, Audit Wales pick up anything, um, significant, then that will be reported back to um, the committee and um, with the amended accounts in January. Okay, yeah. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, any questions on the accounts, please? Any questions to anyone? Are we happy to move them then? So moved. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, we're now moving on now to um, urgent items. Now, there are two urgent items um, which you may have received, you should have received. 7.1 is the update on land of Glee Fields. And I wondered perhaps if Lorna and James could present that now, please. And also, I got a part two on the same item as well. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll, st I'll start off, but thanks very much to James and to uh, Nathan Slater, who's also uh, joining us, the senior planner from the Bailey Morgan Planning Authority. Um, James has been liaising with um, planning colleagues in, in the Vale over the last couple of uh, months in respect of the process um, that we discussed back in February. So this report aims to provide an update to committee in respect of the procedure for the promotion of Glebe Field as a candidate site in the available Morgan LDP review um, and that update is since the last report uh, as I referred to in uh, February this year. It provides an update on the timescales and procedures for the promotion of the site as a candidate site and the documentation on the evid uh, evidential requirements. It also recommends that the committee instruct the planning department of the Bailey Morgan Council to prepare development site review to inform the committee of the potential suitable land uses going forward and the report also updates the committee in respect of an unsolicited offer received from Sully and Lavenock Community Library Trust for two acres of, of the site and that's come in since the last meeting. Um, in terms of background, the committee will recall that the matter was last uh, discussed at the meeting of the 24th of February where committee received advice from uh, Messrs Cook and Arkwright by way of a written report as qualified surveyors and they recommended that the trust hold the land and promote the site of the next LDP review for residential development but I go on further it's not purely residential development but I go on further in, in a second about that. Um, the trustees resolved at that February meeting that officers um, and planning colleagues discuss um, the way forward and we seek clarification in terms of what options are available to committee in terms of the promotion of the site in the next LDP for mixed use for housing and community facilities slash amenities. How best to proceed with such a promotion of the site if the committee were minding to do so. Um, and also advice and recommendations are set out in the report um, following that, that last couple of uh, months discussion between um, James and uh, Nathan. So the main points to consider uh, by way of an update is the LDP review is likely to commence in June 2021. Nathan, step in if I've got anything wrong and you want to update further on this or, or put me right. Um, the nomination process will require the submission of a candidate site form, which requires substantial amount of evidence to support the nomination and the resultant costs in relation to the preparation of such evidence. And the planning department has suggested that development site review, uh, a DSR, is conducted on the land to assess the uses, in particular any mixed uses. 
And if following con uh, consideration of the DSR, the Trust wanted to proceed to make a formal nomination for the site as a candidate site, the DSR would form basis of producing the supporting evidence required for the candidate site form. Um, and whilst the planning department, the council's planning department would be able to produce the DSR, the trust would, if it wished to progress with the nomination, be required to employ an agent to prepare and submit the candidate site form and supporting evidence. Um, in addition to the work uh, with, with on the planning front, uh, since the last committee meeting, it says March in this report, apologies, that was the typo, it should be February. A letter has been received by the former chairman of the committee uh, from the chair of Selly and Lavenock Community Library Trust in connection with the land. And that matter is subject to the report under part two of, of this agenda. Um, the key considerations to consider for this part one report in the event the committee are minded to continue to progress towards disposal of the Glebe field, then it's just a a reference to section 170 and the 19 of the Charities Act um, and committee as trustees are to act in accordance with the qualified surveyor's recommendation or obtain permission from the Charities Commission to dispose of the site in accordance with the qualified, um, other than in accordance with the qualified surveyor's recommendation. So if the committee are minded to progress with the nomination of Glebe Field as a candidate site for the LDP review, then additional information would be needed to be contained with the, with the DSR um, and would ask the committee in identifying on what basis to nominate the site and form a starting point for the evidence required in such a nomination. And of course, the committee are, are, are reminded that we're under no, uh, that you're under no, no duty to dispose of the Glebe Field if, if it chooses not to. Um, so, under financial uh, considerations, the uh, trust are asked um, to consider the cost of the DSR, uh, and we've been indicated a, a cost of circa thousand um, pounds to to put that uh, in motion. Um, and just a reminder that the trust has a duty to manage lands and property held by them in accordance with the scheme of trust and charity law. Uh, and as set out in the report there. The recommendations in terms of the um, part one um, report, so the committee note the procedure and the process of proposing the Glebe Field as a candidate site for the Vale of Glamorgan Council's LDP review. The committee instructs the Vale of Glamorgan Planning Department to undertake a de uh, development site review at a cost of circa £1,000, and that committee notes the reference to the part two agenda item. Nathan, I'm not sure, or, or James, if you wanted to come in um, and expand on any of the points there for, for the committee. Yeah, do you want to come in, Nathan or James, on that? Or do you want to wait for members to ask you any questions? I, I was just going to say, unless Nathan's got any points that he feels needs sort of clarifying at this point, it may be easier if uh, members have got any question, any direct questions relating to it that he could uh, answer. Okay. Yeah, so no, I'd be happy questions? to take questions. Sorry. Cousin. Yeah, fine. That's okay. Um, Nathan, anyone got any questions? Yes, um, Councillor Mahoney. Yeah, Councillor that's Mahoney. Excuse me for being a bit Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. So possibly you're feeling a bit dense. Are we actually in part two or, or still on? No, we're still in part one. Because we haven't moved to part few... two. That's fair enough, because there's quite a number of points I'd like to make upon this, but uh, and I, I conversed with James uh, uh, last year who, who, who offered advice on what's what, that I think I could only ask in part two. So I, are okay. you suggesting I mean, we should we be having a vote moved, now? We haven't moved part two, and obviously we've got recommendations to consider okay. under part one first. Okay. Well, well fair enough, but, but part, part of that is tied up with James' advice of last year. Um, well, Basically, uh, should I be um, pointing out the advice he's get, he's given in confidence as an officer in part one? I, I don't mind doing that if that's fine with you guys. I don't mind. I mean, so long as we feel fine. we're still in part one. Okay. Well, uh, advice I was on. given was, yeah. well, James looking concerned now because he can't say anything private, obviously. So you, you tell me. I don't care. 
he had to unmute himself. Sorry, I was just going to quickly try to remind myself what the advice was. <laughs> As regards um, the duty of uh, a member of this trust um, in realising um, the full value of disposed lands and that a surcharge could be charged against any member of this um, uh, uh, board or trust, if you like, of trustees, uh, if they don't do that, which I have obviously pointed out would mean there's no point to someone vote on anything if we can be surcharged if we voted against getting the most. Now, I understand what's being proposed here is whether this is forwarded to some sort of the LDP or something, which isn't a vote on well, was it a vote on disposing of the land? It's no. Yeah, no. So this, the, the recommendation here is what we've had is a qualified surveyor's report, which is what is required in relation to any proposed disposal by a trust. And um, within that was a recommendation on what the qualified surveyors considered would be um, the best approach in terms of um, a maximising income. But at the same time, there is no duty on the trust at this point or in the future to actually continue with a disposal. But at the same time, yeah, there is a duty to obtain where you are disposing to obtain best value. And there is a potential legal risk in terms of if it was found that trustees voted in a way that resulted in a disposal that didn't. Um, obtain best value for land then potentially there there could be um, a, a surcharge but I don't think anything that's been um, anything within the recommendations put forward today um, is in any way kind of going towards that this is purely acting in on the basis of the recommendations put forward by the qualified surveyor okay do you want to respond Kevin yeah, so, so I don't mean to be hogging things, but obviously I have to um, uh, pursue what we're on about. Well, unless I misunderstood what Lorna said, and I think you just touched on it yourself, the surveyor it actually said that we're obliged to follow the surveyor's advice. Well, the surveyor's advice is it was to possibly flog That's... it or put it on the LDP. So I, I, that conflict con contradicts it, doesn't it? No, it doesn't, because that's only if the trust was minded to dispose, because if there's there's no issue there's the trust is would not be in breach of its duty by holding on to its land and holding on to its assets there's all it all it means is where you've got an asset that you're seeking to dispose of there's a duty to take professional advice in yes. order uh, to ensure that you're obtaining best value and and i don't disagree with that but we're having a vote now on whether to put it forward for disposal of. We've already heard, uh, I think, whether it was from Nathan or, or one of his colleagues last year, that the part included in the report is the difficulty of um, getting any building uh, done on that site because of the amount of building that's going on in Sully and the other area at the moment, including the social uh, building and all the rest of it. So here's the thing. Why are we voting? To, oh, I realise this what a vote is, a democratic process, to put it forward to an LDP here. Um, we've had, um, as Lorna has said, I was, that's what the matter I was going to bring up uh, actually on the side panel there, is that we've had a bid from one concerned party, which again, I, I stress I have no links with whatsoever, um, have made a bid of some sort. I don't even know what that is. That's how unconnected I am to them. So if somebody's put a bid in for part of that land that the councillors here or the trustees think is a decent bid for a, a laudable aim and a decent value for money as you quite rightly point out which is the strictures that we're under um then surely that should be considered as well shouldn't it yeah i, I think the one thing i'd say is again that the, the recommendation isn't to, to vote to dispose of the land the recommendation is to carry out some additional works if the a potential disposal is something that we are still considering the way in which we were advised would be best to do that would be by um, nominating it as a candidate site. In order to do, in order to make the decision as to which, whether you want to to move forward to that, what we're saying is that a, a development site review by the planning or 
by the planners would enable you to have a better understanding of what uses would be best um, best suited to that site, not only in terms of pure cash recovery, but also in terms of what from a planning perspective might be uh, possible. It may be that a full residential scheme wouldn't be possible. It also could be the case that a full residential scheme wouldn't be something that the trustees might want to look at and they might choose to hold on to the land for a further number of years um, to lease it out or but that's and hold as an asset sort of until later down the line. Yes. Okay, do you want sorry, to come back uh, on that finally, Kevin, at all? Well, yeah, it's something that's got to be discussed. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm hogging a conversation here, but it's a conversation, if it's got to go on for an hour and a half, it's got to go on for an hour and a half. Now, the situation is, and I, and I go back to it, if somebody has put a bid in, whether you've mentioned the, the Sully Library Trust or anybody else for that matter, for a slice of that land, then surely that has to be considered and, it, uh, and the best value got for that land. Kevin, Kevin um, we are going to consider uh, it under the next item. But I don't want to just consider it now, all right? No, I but I said, we, yeah. God, if I come that's, in, saying, that's, 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 that's fair enough. But I'm still saying the the advice, and I still perhaps I am being dense here, is the fact that if any of that land is put up for sale, whether in slices or on block, we don't actually have a vote. We can't have a vote because, as according to your advice, that we must raise the best value for that land that we can. I'm not, who am I to can dispute I, that? I but just, the point, there's no point to spoken on it, is it? In, it's um, academic. Kevin, Kevin, I think what James is saying, and I will get other people come in a moment. What James is saying, you basically have got two options here. If we decide to move to the recommendations, support the recommendations, then basically we're given two choices. The two choices are that we could either retain the um, the land if we want to, or alternatively. We can sell it, but if we sell it, it's on the basis of it probably going into the LDP process, on the basis of it being valued, on the basis of its uses. At the moment, by the fact if we go on to these recommendations and support them or not, if we support them, that means we're taking a process forward. If we don't, then we're not taking a process forward. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lorna and James. Thank you, um, Chairman. Yes, I mean, the report isn't asking for authority to dispose of anything at this time. It's asking for authority to move forward a process which is recommended through um, planning colleagues. Now, if committee don't, uh, as the report says, um, the, the, the trust don't um, have to declare land surface, don't have to dispose of land if that is the um, decision of, of, of the trust, of committee. Um, so I suppose the decision that we're, we're asking for under the part one report is to um, uh, allow officers to, to move forward with a, um, a process under the um, uh, planning requirements and then we would report back to committee with the results of, of those um, um, uh, discussions and applications. Now, um, it, it's within trusts remit then to decide that um, based on the outcome uh, of, of that, if they do recommend, if you do recommend today, you resolve today to go with the recommendations, there's absolutely no obligation to do anything with that after that. So you would be reporting back. Um, so it's not a request for a resolution to dispose of the site at this time. It's a, it's a request to go ahead and do a bit more work um, and to engage the um, local, local planning um, authority officers to, to, to do that work on the trust behalf. OK, Great, I hope that you. clarifies the situation. All right, and can we move to the recommendations? Are you happy to support the recommendations one, two, three? Yes, Councillor Cox does, Councillor Drake, Councillor Marnie, yeah. OK, anyone dissenting? No, OK then, thank you. We now move to the part two report now, please. Can we have a second? Can we also, yeah, we have got a second there. That was Councillor Cox and, and then Councillor Drake. Can we now move part two? Move part two. 
Thank you very much. OK, we now move to the second item of the agenda, which is the part two report. Um, Lorna or James, do you want to present it, please? I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. Can I just um, let the attendees know that they need to now leave the meeting as we've now Thank moved you. to part two? And it's Thank you. So anyone who's present as an attendee, if you are please able to leave, I can see that you're present. Um, if you can't figure it out, I can dismiss you from the meeting. I'll give you a couple of seconds just to do it yourselves first. Right, so to confirm, Chairman, that the only people left on the meeting at present are committee members and officers as expected. And for the sake of the recording, I'm going to confirm at the moment that we will stop recording now.